And then they, they often run through a parade of horribles, that if there is a government shutdown, if the continuing resolution doesn't pass, here are all the horrible things that happen. Now, some of the parade of horribles that are suggested are just contrary to law. For example, they'll sometimes suggest people won't get their Social Security payments, or they won't get their Medicare, or they won't get their Medicaid, or we won't pay interest on the debt. Now, that's just not the way the government works. All of those are, are paid through mandatory spending. Continuing resolution doesn't impact those continuing to happen, and I would note in 1995, when there were two partial temporary shutdowns, Social Security checks continue to go out, interest on the debt continued to be paid, all of that continued. But another thing that those who are trying to force Obamacare on the American people frequently want to hold hostage is the men and women of the military. Now, as my friend from Wyoming noted, if we passed appropriation bills, that wouldn't be a problem. The House has passed an appropriation bill for the military. And yet the majority leader, Harry Reid, the Democratic majority, would not have taken that bill up. If we had passed it into law, you could quantify the chances of the men and women of the military having their pay suspended to mathematical certainty at 0.000%. If we'd passed the appropriation bill, the issue would be off the tape. But you know what? The Senate didn't do its job. We didn't pass an appropriation bill in the military. And so that leaves a tiny window for the president to threaten if Congress listens to the American people and defunds Obamacare, we may just stop paying the men and women of our military. Now, let me be absolutely clear. Under no circumstances ever should the United States not pay the men and women of our military who risk their lives on the front lines. And current law gives the president ample authority to continue to pay the military regardless of whether there's a temporary partial shutdown or not. What has happened in the past, if and when there's been a temporary partial shutdown, is non-essential government services are temporarily suspended. By any measure, the military of the United States is not non-essential. And so, if we had done our job, as the senator from Wyoming puts that forward, if we had passed appropriation bills, we would have taken off the table one after the other after the other of these hostages that are being held as the price to force Obamacare on the American people. And you know, part of the reason, Mr. President, why the Democratic majority of the Senate does that is because the debate on the merits of Obamacare is very hard to win. If you've noticed, we're by and large not engaging in a debate on the merits of Obamacare in terms of defunding Obamacare. We're not, we're by and large, you don't see Democratic senators talking about all the people who are losing their jobs. You don't see Democratic senators talking about all the people who are having their hours forcibly reduced. You don't see Democratic senators talking about all the people who are seeing skyrocketing health insurance premiums or who are, who are losing their health insurance. Instead, we see Democratic senators go on television and say, well, if they stick to their guns on this, it's going to shut down the government. Well, as the senator from Wyoming points out, there's no reason for that. We could have passed the appropriations bill. Or we could do what the House of Representatives did. House of Representatives in an overwhelming vote, 232 members, including two Democrats, voted to fund every aspect of the federal government, including, I would note, some parts of the federal government that I feel certain House Republicans are not fans of, and yet they voted to fund all of it, except for Obamacare. I know my friend Congressman Louis Gohmert has come over to the Senate floor in a show of solidarity, and I appreciate Congressman Gohmert joining us. I would note, if the Senate wants to avoid a shutdown, it can do so. Indeed, last night, I took the opportunity to ask the majority leader, why don't we just avert this whole train wreck right now? Why don't we agree by unanimous consent to pass the continuing resolution that the House has passed, take the prospect of a shutdown off the table entirely, and defund Obamacare because it's hurting the American people? And, and Majority Leader Reid objected, said no. No, he wants to keep Obamacare, he wants to force it on the American people, and critically, 
He wants to use the threat of a government shutdown to try and do so. That, I would suggest, is inconsistent with the obligation that every senator has. Mr. President, I'd uh, ask permission to ask another question through the chair with the senator being allowed to keep his keep the floor. I'm happy to yield for a question without, without yielding the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think there are, I think, uh, w would you agree that there are a number of things in this bill that have been changed because we recognize that um, those things wouldn't work. We've changed, not we, the president has changed a number of these things, and I'm having trouble finding in the law where those changes come from. Uh, there isn't a lot of waiver authority in the bill, but every time that uh, a difficulty is found with the bill, then there appears to be a waiver so that that particular part of the bill no longer exists. Um, I've never seen that done before on legislation. How do they take a piece of the law that's in the bill that doesn't have a waiver right and go ahead and exempt us under that particular part of the law? And one particular part on that that I'm particularly sensitive on because I worked on it very diligently as the bill came through committee and that piece was the one where Congress should be under the the law that we pass, Congress and the staff. Now that got remodeled, as you'll recall, a little bit so that the committee staffs didn't have to come under it because the committee staffs were actually the one that finish up the bill. But we had intended for all of our staffs to be under that bill. So wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that uh, uh, one of the amendments that we haven't been able to vote on, it would have only taken 30 minutes to do a 15-minute vote. That's kind of standard around here. It takes us a little longer than 15 minutes to do a 15-minute vote. Heck, it takes us 20 minutes to do a 10-minute vote. And that has to follow on the heels of a 30-minute, 15-minute vote. But um, we could have had that, had that vote, but we weren't allowed to. And what, the, what that amendment, as you'll recall, would have done is put Congress back under the bill. It would have subjected Congress to suffering the same exact thing that the American public is going to start experiencing on Tuesday as they go into the exchange, or at the very latest by the 1st of January when they're required to do that. If their company is no longer uh, providing them with insurance, the company will pay a little penalty, but they get to come under the exchange. But they don't get to bring their tax, the company's tax-free donation to their uh, health care along with them. But that's the way we had envisioned it working for Congress, too. They would not get a special dispensation. So we brought up this amendment that would uh, require that not only would Congress come under it, but since the president's the one who exempted this and didn't have the right to exempt us from it, we thought that perhaps he and the vice president and the political appointees maybe ought to come under that same bill. I mean, why wouldn't the president want to come under it? After all, it's called Obamacare. It's named after him. But uh, apparently there's a, a tremendous desire not to do that, to explain that the federal government is different. And that's exactly what the American people are upset about, that we're different and we shouldn't be different. And that's one of the things that could have been taken care of if we'd have taken this all through regular order. So I appreciate your efforts to be able to do something. And uh, I, I would ask if, if you think that we ought to be exempted under any parts of this law or that these exemptions would be legal by a president to do if it's not written in the law. So I'm, as, as a lawyer, you probably have better insight into that as I do and a constitutionalist. So. Uh, that, that's why I ask you the question. Does the president have the right to do that? Well, I thank my friend from Wyoming for that very good question, and, and the simple answer is no. Uh, the president does not have the authority to rewrite the law or to ignore the law. You know, we operate under a principle that no one is above the law. We're a nation of laws and not of men. And 
There are many disturbing aspects of Obamacare, but one of the persistent ones is this law has been such a train wreck that the approach of the president has been over and over again simply to disregard the, the language of the law, to, to pretend as if the law of the United States doesn't exist because, as passed, it was such a bad law. And the way that is manifested, as my friend from Wyoming pointed out so accurately, is to grant exemptions to politically favored classes. So it started out with big business. Giant corporations were all, with a wave of a pen, told, don't worry about Obamacare. It's supposed to kick in for you January 1st of next year. But the president has decided he's going to do a favor for big businesses that he won't do for small businesses, that he won't do for hardworking American families. The next significant waiver we saw was for members of Congress. And it occurred after a closed-door meeting here in the Capitol where Majority Leader Harry Reid and all of the Senate Democrats, according to the public reports, came to the president and said, we want out of the Obamacare exchange. Now, as my friend from Wyoming pointed out, if the Obamacare exchanges were a good thing, if Obamacare was working, why would there be panic among Senate Democrats saying, please exempt members of Congress? Why would there be panic among congressional staffers, as I can assure you there is in a bipartisan way, about being subjected to these Obamacare exchanges? Why would there be such opposition to subjecting the political appointees of the Obama administration to the Obamacare exchanges? Or as my friend from Wyoming pointed out so cor correctly, the president himself. It is, after all, called popularly Obamacare, and even the president has embraced that name. So you would think, I suspect if there were a health care plan called NZ Care, the senator from Wyoming would be happy to be covered by it. And he would probably be very careful to draft a plan that he wouldn't be willing and excited to be covered by. What does it say that the people in charge of enforcing Obamacare on the American people want out. They want a special rule. The IRS employees unions, the men and women who are given the statutory responsibility of going to America, going to hardworking Americans and forcing Americans to comply with Obamacare, they have said in writing, please, let us out of Obamacare. We don't want to be a part of this thing. This is our health care you're talking about. The most profound issue we are dealing with here today is not jobs, it's not the economy, it's not health care, it's not Obamacare. The most profound issue we are dealing with here today is the fundamental divide between Washington and the American people. There is a ruling class in Washington, D.C. that believes they are subjected to different rules than the American people, that it's perfectly appropriate for political friends and allies of the president to get exemptions while single moms and young people and Hispanics and African Americans, the people struggling, union workers, struggling to pay the bills, provide for their kids, they don't get an exemption. Just those that walk the corridors of power, just those with access to political influence. And you know what that does, Mr. President? strengthens politicians even more. Look, politicians are in the business of granting dispensations, granting exceptions. Well, that means everybody in the country that wants some exception better come to politicians and support them. You want to talk about something corrosive to our system of democracy, why do you think the American people hold this body in such low regard? Perhaps it's because we pass laws that treat ourselves better than everybody else and we don't listen to the American people. Mr. President, we need to make D.C. listen. And I am told, by the way, that during the course of this filibuster that the hashtag Make D.C. Listen has at times been trending number one in the country. And I would suggest to my colleagues who have come in support of this effort, it is because the American people understand <laughs> and are frustrated with why doesn't Washington listen to us and for at least a brief moment each of us together, the senator from Wyoming, the senator from Oklahoma, we are trying to serve as a voice for the American people that don't often have a voice in Washington. 
we need to make D.C. listen. There is nothing more important we could do than that. The senator yield for a question without losing the floor. I'm happy to yield for a question without yielding the floor. Uh, first of all, let me just suggest that a lot of people have forgotten uh, the cost of this thing. I'd like to run over a couple of things, if it's all right with the senator, and then ask him if this same thing that is happening in my state of Oklahoma is happening in his uh, state to the south of Oklahoma, the state of Texas. You know, we, in just a week, a week away from when people will have to start signing up for Obamacare, and I commend uh, Senator Cruz for reminding the American people that this law doesn't have to be a new reality. It doesn't have to be. We can stop it. Uh, there are still lingering questions about exactly what this is all going to look like. But we do know that this reform law, as they call it, continues to be expensive, burdensome, and overreaching. So much more as time goes by. It started out just a little bit that didn't sound too bad to the American people. It's estimated that the program now will cost as much as $2.4 trillion over the years. You know, it's, it's hard to talk about these, uh, I suggest to my, my friend from Texas. We know around here what a trillion dollars is, but most people really don't. It's hard to really uh, understand uh, this thing as to what is going on in America. $2.6 trillion over 10 years once this thing would be fully implemented if they're successful in doing it. Now, the cost of this have only continued to rise since the law was passed. Most recently, the administration has asked for another $5.4 billion in discretionary funds next year for implementation. Now, $5.4 billion in discretionary funds, let's stop and think about that. One of the worst things about the Obama administration, I have to say this, and the senator from Texas understands this since he's on the Senate Armed Services Committee, is how this president has been disarming America. And the, the discretionary money that would be coming out of this is money that otherwise could be used for our systems and to support our war fighters over there. And that's just the cost to the federal government. It doesn't include the lost hours, the wages and the employees and the lost jobs and the cost to families. You know, everyone agrees that premiums are going to rise. In my home state of Oklahoma, we have a guy named John Doak. He, he's the insurance commissioner. After talking to insurance companies, he says that Oklahoma's rates could, uh, will increase a minimum of 30% and up to 100%. And under one of four insurers in Oklahoma, rates will vary from $143 a month for a 30-year-old with basic coverage to $673 uh, per month for a 64-year-old who wants the best coverage. Now, remember the president promised to lower the premiums, uh, premiums by 2500 What I want to do, uh, if I could, is, is there is a little bit of good news. And I know that the senator from Texas is aware of it, but I'm going to ask you uh, how many other people are aware of this. We have a great attorney general in the state of Oklahoma. His name is Scott Pruitt. And I suggest you probably met Scott Pruitt. Uh, before we vote on this thing, we have a serious question as to whether or not some of these subsidies will go even further. What Scott Pruitt did, he filed a lawsuit in, that stated that... Uh, 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 that through the courts are, are leading the charge to dismantle Obamacare and put an end to it. So just last month, the judge overseeing the lawsuit ruled against a motion filed by the Obama administration to dismiss the case, which means the case will proceed. That's huge. I mean, if, if this goes through, this whole thing will be dismantled. That's why we need to, to, to go ahead and fight this thing as best we can recognizing that there are other areas where the American people are speaking. Certainly, Scott Pruitt is doing really great things. Uh, I heard you, uh, the senator uh, mention uh, uh, Congressman Louis Gomer. Congressman Gomer is, uh, is a very close friend of mine. We've been together in a lot of things. And I was visiting with him. Actually, he's in the chamber right now and would like to, uh, to kind of share with us some of the things that are happening in his district, which is eastern Texas. Now... Just uh, some of the letters that he gets back, and this is uh, from someone. He said, to get set up on the software was too expensive. She also didn't want to be limited. On the time she felt she needed to spend with her parents, therefore she stopped taking Medicare, had to go on strict cash basis. My wife's doctor was, uh, has just retired because he did not want to deal with Obamacare. The, uh, 
the uh, a letter that came in from someone whose name is Katie Smith uh, said, "Dear Congressman uh, Gomer," and he goes through. She goes through quite a letter. Then she says, "The explanation from IBM was that they projected that health care costs under the current IBM." Med Medicare eligibility retirement plan options would nearly triple by 2020. Uh, another one uh, uh, from uh, Riverside Cottages, I guess that's someplace in eastern Texas. We were notified July 15th, 2013, that my husband's insurance coverage, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana, Montana Comprehensive Health Insur Assurance, will terminate December 31st, 2013. When my husband contacted Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they told him that this policy will no longer exist due to Obamacare. He will need to find uh, new coverage. And it goes on and on. It's an interesting thing. And the reason I'm reading Texas letters right now is because we received a lot of them, but they're up in my office someplace. So this thing really hits home and hits home hard. So I would just like to uh, uh, ask that my friend uh, from, uh, from Texas, if he's received a lot of these anecdotal letters of people who are suffering really serious hardships, uh, anticipating what's going to happen. Uh, when this uh, becomes a reality. I thank my friend from Oklahoma uh, for his excellent question. And let me say at the outset, I am grateful for Senator Inhofe's leadership and for his courage. From the outset, Senator Inhofe has been with Mike Lee and me on this fight, fighting to defund Obamacare. And then let me note, uh, Senator Inhofe, like some of the other senators who came to the floor of the Senate this afternoon, including Senator Roberts and Senator Sessions and Senator Enzi, are respected veterans of this institution, are leaders who have earned the respect of their colleagues. And I am grateful for Senator Inhofe being willing to stand up and be a leader in this fight. That courage is contagious. And I hope it will continue to be even more contagious in the Republican conference. I hope by the time we come to the cloture vote on Friday or Saturday that we see all 46 Republicans united in voting against shutting off debate, against allowing Majority Leader Harry Reid the ability to fund Obamacare with a straight 51 vote party vote. Party yes, vote. my friend, though, before that happens, I think it's really important, and don't you agree, that people in this country have to know what this is really all about. This is socialized medicine. Now, a lot of them didn't believe that. Only, let me get the date on this. Do you remember the date that uh, Harry Reid? Last week, uh, the leader, leader Harry, uh, Harry Reid, uh, on the PBS Nevada Week in Review, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid uh, was asked whether his goal was to move Obamacare to a single-payer system. His answer was yes, yes, Absolutely yes. Now, do a lot of the people know what a single-payer system is? That is essentially socialized medicine. Uh, I want to kind of relive. You, you said some of the more seasoned one. Yes, I was around during the Clinton administration when there's a thing that's called uh, uh, Hillary Healthcare. Does the, my friend from uh, uh, Texas remember Hillary Healthcare? Uh, I, I, I do indeed, and I remember in particular at the time, the press, all of the graybeards in Washington saying at the time Hillary Care was unstoppable. Can't be stopped. You need to accept it. Republicans need to get together. If you'll recall, initially, the response was with something widely described as Hillary Care light. And back then, in the midst of the Hillary Care fight, there were a few courageous leaders in the Senate and the House who stood up against Hillary Care. And what changed that fight, what changed that battle, was the American people rising up. At the end of the day, it's the only thing that it, can win any fights. Yeah, and, and I would suggest uh, that's exactly what did happen. I can remember <laughs> going from Washington to my hometown of Tulsa. Normally, I have to go through Chicago. Chicago actually is where the AMA had its headquarters, and it's probably still there. I always remember this because I was rejoicing. I was coming back after the long fight against Hillary Healthcare, socialized medicine. I remember asking the question on the Senate floor. I said, you know, try to explain this to me. If this socialized medicine doesn't work in Great Britain, it doesn't work in Sweden, it doesn't work in Canada, 
uh, why do you think it would work in this country? Now, they'll never say it, but what they're thinking is, well, if I were running it, it would work. And that's, we got that point across slowly. It took months and months. They started way ahead with Hillary Healthcare. Then we were catching up. Just like right now, people are realizing this is a failed uh, socialized medicine effort, and we had won this thing. And I remember, and this kind of relates to what's happening today, I was on that plane going through Chicago to Tulsa, and I picked up the Wall Street Journal, opened it up, and there was a full-page ad by the AMA supporting Hillary Healthcare. Of course, I stopped in, in Chicago and went by to visit them at the AMA. And it just seems like a lot of people like them. Now, these are a lot of, uh, an organization representing a lot of real smart doctors and others who were saying that we can't win. We can't win this thing. And therefore, let's go ahead and give it. We had already won when they ran that ad. Now, I don't know how many days before that they, they put the ad in, but nonetheless, that's, that's happened. I didn't know whether my... My friend remembered that because my friend was not in the Senate at that time. But that's exactly what happened. And it's very similar, very analogous to a lot of things that are happening today. The other thing I, I did want to mention, I, to let you know, I, anytime you have desperation setting in, there are a lot of things that go around to confuse people. Let me tell you what's happening in Oklahoma I found about today. This was a surprise, my friend from Texas. You know, there are 14 of us that started, you and me and, and, and 12 other people, about six weeks ago, I guess it was. And so all this time, we've been lockstep trying to do, see what we could do to stop this thing from happening to my 20 kids and grandkids and the rest of America. And so people realized I was there in the very beginning, as the senator from Texas mentioned. And yet we have some of the Obama people are doing robocalls in my state of Oklahoma uh, posing as Tea Party people, saying, call Inhofe because he is for, uh, for uh, Obamacare. Can you believe that something like that is happening? I asked my good friend. It shows to me a level of desperation to get people confused as to what the issue is and want to get to these deadlines so we can get past and we can have this thing as a reality that every liberal in America probably uh, is supporting. Well, I thank my friend from Oklahoma for that question. I, you know, I have to say I'm I'm not surprised. And, you know, there's an old adage among courtroom lawyers. If you have the facts, pound the facts. If you have the law, pound the law. And if you don't have neither, pound the table. To be honest, the approach of Obamacare defenders is an awful lot of pa table pounding. It's an awful lot of let's discuss anything other than what's in fact happening. So, if you pick up any newspaper talking about this issue, what will the reporters write about? You know, the political reporters in Washington, D.C., I think some of them may be frustrated because they really wanted to be Hollywood gossip reporters. Because they cover these issues as a battle of personalities. You want to get a story on the front pages of the paper, find some anonymous congressional staffer to say something scurrilous, ideally include a little profanity in it, and the political reporters of this town eat that up. <laughs> because apparently the only thing that matters are the personalities bickering back and forth. And you know, in many ways that's unsurprising. Because if you're trying to defend a law that the lead author calls a train wreck, that the unions who supported it are desperately trying to get out from under, that you and your Democratic Senate colleagues are desperately asking for yourselves to be exempted from it, then you sure as heck don't want to talk about how the law is operating. You sure as heck don't want to talk about all of the people that are losing their jobs because of Obamacare. You sure as heck don't want to talk about all the people who can't get jobs, all the small businesses that aren't growing because of Obamacare. You certainly don't want to talk about all of the people forced into part-time work, into 29 hours a week work. You don't want to talk about the insurance premiums that are going up, that are pricing people out of the insurance markets. And you especially don't want to talk about all the people losing their health insurance. You read the stories from East Texas of citizens there losing their health insurance. That's happening all over the country. So it doesn't surprise me that you're seeing deceptive robocalls in the state of Oklahoma 
because they don't want to debate on the merits of Obamacare because it's indefensible. Mm -hmm. And so the only strategy is smoke and mirrors. The only strategy is, well, if we can't talk about the law, let's convince them about something else. Let's distract them. Let's figure out anything to take people's minds off of the underlying issue. And I would note to my friend in Oklahoma, the only way that strategy works is if the American people don't believe Washington will listen to them. And look, there's a lot of reason for the American people to believe Washington's not going to listen to them because Washington hasn't been listening to us for a long, long time. Politicians on both sides of this aisle have lost touch with their constituents. Don't go home, don't go to town hall meetings and view the desires of their constituents as simply uninformed and not relevant to doing our jobs. Let, if, let, let, let me just say, you said and, something that was... Is so profound. And I'm yielding for a question, but not yielding the floor. Yes, of course. It, this would be real quick. But I, uh, when you said that if you don't have logic on your side, you don't have the facts on your side, you don't have the public on your side, what do you do? Well, it's not just pounding the table. It's calling names. I went through this. I, I uh, suggested to my friend 12 years ago when the Kyoto Treaty was up and everyone thought, well, global warming's coming. And that was going to be everyone's trip to the White House was to support global warming until we realized what the cost would be, and I was the bad guy to stand up and say, no, this isn't true. First of all, it is a hoax. Secondly, if it, even if it's not, we couldn't do it. Well, that's when all the name calling, I can remember being called in writing and by a fairly prominent person that I should be hanged for treason at that time. This is what they get to. And that's what my friend is going through right now with a lot of people who don't, don't, don't agree with him. But, now, 12 years later, what's happened? People realize that it was right. I'm not suggesting it's going to be 12 years before they realize that you're right on this, but it means that what's the behavior of people today is something that has happened many, many times in the past. And so uh, I would just uh, ask my friend to uh, remember that and realize uh, quite often when you're right in a controversial issue, you're going to be the subject of a lot of criticism, a lot of cussing, a lot of name calling, and a lot of violence. Uh, so uh, this isn't the first time. From day one since I arrived here in the Senate. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I do hope uh, that, that other colleagues in this body don't, don't listen to all of your remarks and suddenly discover that hanging for treason is an option because that, that may not work out terribly well for me. But... Uh, uh, I, I hope that becomes purely figurative. Um, and I'll note at the end of the day, listen, you and I and all 100 of us, we're, we're incredibly fortunate. We have lived lives in this country of, of relative privilege. We, everyone in the United States Senate enjoys a good home has a soft bed, I suspect, has air conditioning, has food on the table. And I'll tell you, I feel blessed to have a wife who I, is my best friend in the world and whom I love with all my heart, to have two precious little girls who are the joy of my life. And to be able to come to work every day, to walk on this Senate floor, I, there is not a day when that doesn't take my breath away. The idea that the son of a Cuban immigrant with nothing could find himself suddenly elected to the Senate to have the opportunity to come in every day. Uh, it's truly awesome in, in, in the real sense of the word. You know, awesome, there was a time when awesome was a valley girl phrase for everything. But awesome, in its real sense of inspiring awe, I will tell you, I find it awesome every day to walk into this capital and to have the amazing privilege to serve as you and I do and all 100 of us do. And the slings and arrows that one deals with serving in public office, to be perfectly candid, are all chicken feed. You know, the old phrase is about sticks and stones. Listen. Someone saying something mean about you is nothing 
compared to the suffering that so many people across this country are experiencing. You know, as you sit down with one single mom who is working her heart out to provide for her kids, because she wants her kids to have a good home, she wants her kids to have an education, she wants her kids to have a future, she's juggling, her hours have been reduced 29 hours a week, she doesn't know what's coming next. That's hard work, that's suffering. This ain't nothing. You know, if you talk, as I know you have many times, to a disabled veteran who's worried about the impact on our economy of Obamacare of jobs drying up, who's worried about his grandson who's just coming out of school right now but can't get a job. That is a lot more important than the political bickering back and forth. And that was my point about all of the press coverage dealing with it's not about any personality here. It is about listening to the American people. The American people do not give a flying flip about any member of the United States Senate. None of the 100 of us. What the American people are interested in is what we've always been interested in. Which is freedom. Which is our families which is providing for our kids, being a good example to our kids, which is working for a better world and working so that our kids and their kids have an even better future and opportunity than we have had. And you know, Mr. President, if you go back centuries, every generation of Americans has been able to give to the next generation a brighter future, greater prosperity, greater opportunity. And, and we're on the verge of being the first generation of Americans not to do so. You want to put your finger on the discontent so many Americans feel, that goes right to the heart of it. What we're doing in Washington isn't working. The economic malaise, I refer to the last five years as the great stagnation. Because for four consecutive years, our economy has grown on average 0.9% a year. It's not working. Now, intelligent, rational people looking at a set of policies that isn't working would do the intelligent, rational thing. We'd correct course. We'd say, okay, this isn't working. What has worked? But that's not happening. And it's not happening because even though it's not working, the failures aren't visited on Congress. The failures are visited on the American people. Congress exempts itself from Obamacare. It doesn't even do it in the law. The law says we're covered by it. But instead, Democratic senators go to the president and say, we want a special exemption for us that doesn't apply to the American people. And so the fundamental problem is, elected officials are not listening to the people. You know, earlier I was reading the article about the lost generation of young people from the Wall Street Journal that ran on September 19th. I made it about halfway through, and let me finish that article because I think it raises some very important issues. The last thing I read was the young man, 23 years old, working a job where he says that his job at the grocery store, he doesn't have a college degree, but he's seeing more and more college degrees getting it, and he's saying, gosh, I thought this was a job to help me pay my way through school. If this is the end job after you get a college degree, what does it say about opportunity? And the last quote I, I read was, I think a lot about whether I'm ahead or behind, he says. I really hope I'm not ahead. The article continues, Americans aren't the only ones asking such questions. The financial crisis that began in the U.S. quickly rippled across the Atlantic, bursting similar credit and property bubbles in countries such as the U.K., Ireland, and Spain, and crippling a European banking sector that had dense links with the U.S. financial system. Much of Europe's economy was plunged into the, its worst post-war slump and has struggled even more than the U.S. to regain its pre-crisis levels of growth and jobs. In Europe, the banking crisis also triggered a second wave crisis, massive capital flights from southern European countries that relied on foreign borrowing that came close to unraveling the euro. Let me move forward beyond the Europeans, back to where it discusses the American young people again. 
There are signs that the weak economy is leading to deep societal changes. An entire generation is putting off the rituals of early adulthood, moving away, getting married, buying a home and having children. The marriage rate among young people, long in decline, fell even faster during the recession. And the birth rate for women in their early 20s fell to an all-time low in 2012. Mr. President, why do you think it is that young people are putting off marriage or putting off kids? According to a recent Pew Research study, 56% of 18 to 24-year-olds lived with their parents in 2012, up from 51% in 2007. 56% of 18 to 24 year olds lived with their parents in 2012. An increase that looks particularly dramatic because the share has changed, had changed precious little the previous four decades. Moreover, many young people are losing hopes of matching the prosperity of their parents' generation. Mr. President, I talked a minute ago about our hope, all of us, that our kids have greater opportunity. What does it say that young people are losing hope about even matching where we are, much less having greater prosperity? Just 11% of employed young people in a recent Pew survey said they had a career as opposed to just a job. Fewer than half said they were even on track for one. John Connolly thought he was on right track in life. The son of a New Jersey auto mechanic, he was the first in his family to go to college when he enrolled in Rutgers in 2009. I will note as an aside, Mr. President, my uncle went to Rutgers. I went to college, Princeton in New Jersey, and my uncle was often fond of reminding me that the very first collegiate football game that ever was played in the United States was played between Rutgers and Princeton. And at every Thanksgiving, my uncle Len would remind me who won, and it was Rutgers that won. Princeton got whipped in that Princeton game, and, and I'm sure John Connolly was quite aware that Rutgers had won the first collegiate football game in the United States. Four years later, the 22-year-old found himself $21,000 in debt, without a permanent job, and sleeping on friends' couches in New York and Brooklyn. Quote, I hear a lot of stuff that people in my generation aren't buying cars or houses, and I'm a step beyond that. I can't even pay rent on time, Mr. Connolly says. I have a hard time planning 10 years in the future when I can hardly plan three months in the future. At Rutgers, Mr. Connolly was an honors student and president of the student assembly. But wary of taking on more debt, he ended up withdrawing from school with three credit hours to go until graduation. After a summer spent living with friends while living at, working a temporary job at a Brooklyn nonprofit, he found a grant that allowed him to re-enroll in school this fall but he still doesn't know what he'll do when he graduates at the end of the semester. Quote, I kind of did everything I was quote unquote supposed to be doing, he says. The costs of a lost generation, and I'm still reading from the Wall Street Journal, go beyond the impact on young people themselves. A 2012 analysis commissioned by the Corporation for National and Community Service, a federal agency, estimated that the 6.7 million American youth who are disconnected from both school and work could ultimately cost taxpayers $1.6 trillion in lost tax receipts, increased reliance on government benefits and other expenses. Look at broader economic and social effects such as lost earning and increased criminal activity and the impact tops $4.7 trillion, the researchers estimate. Would the Senator yield for a question? Senator yield. I'm happy to yield for a question without yielding the floor. Senator from Illinois. It's my understanding that uh, the Senator's position is that um, if we do not defund Obamacare, as he has characterized it, the Health Care Reform Act, that he believes we should shut down the government on October the 1st. Is that the Senator's position? I thank the senator from Illinois for that question, and that most assuredly is not my position, so I, th I thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Let me be very, very clear. I do not believe we should shut down the federal government. 
The only reason we might shut down the federal government is if President Obama and Majority Leader Reid decide they want to force a government shutdown. What I believe we should do is the same thing the House of Representatives did, the same thing that the House courageously did, which is last Friday the House of Representatives voted to fund every aspect of the federal government, every bit of it, including parts they disagreed with, except for Obamacare. And I would note for my friend from Illinois, they did so in response to the American people because the American people are hurting under Obamacare. Would the senator yield to, uh, further for question? I'm happy to yield for a question without the senator has floor. spoken at length many times, including today, about his education. And uh, I respect it. He's gone to some very famous schools. Uh, certainly the senator uh, understands that it takes 60 votes to achieve the goal that he is trying to achieve, and which means that the senator believes he has at least all the votes on his side of the aisle and another 14 votes on the Democratic side of the aisle to repeal Obamacare. Does the senator have that belief? I thank the senator for that question, and I thank the senator for the comment he has made in public, noting uh, that, that, that having attended the schools I, I have, that perhaps I hadn't learned to count to 60. Um, I, I will note that I'm quite familiar with what is necessary to defund Obamacare. And, and what I have said for months is this is a long process. I am not remotely Pollyannish. I am not remotely under the uh, illusion that this is going to be a short, quick process that suddenly Obamacare will be defunded. And, and I, I'm getting to the answer to your question, but it is a detailed answer, and so if you'll forgive me, I will take a few moments to, to lay it out. The first step, in my view, to this process was unifying and motiva motivating the American people. This process was never going to work unless the American people became engaged in historic numbers. And so I spent much, much of the month of August and September during our recess traveling the state of Texas, traveling the country, doing everything I could to go directly to the American people, to go around the lobbyists, go around the entrenched interests in Washington, go straight to the American people. And I'll tell you, the response was incredible. Everywhere you'd go, you see 1,000, 2,000 people show up. We've seen over 1.6 million Americans sign a national petition to defund Obamacare. That was the first step. Now, that wasn't going to be enough, but it was the critical first step. The second step was what happened last week. It was the House of Representatives voting to defund Obamacare. Now, I would note, as the senator from Illinois is well aware, that as recently as a couple of weeks ago, every learned observer, every pundit, everyone in Washington said it's impossible that the House is going to pass a continuing resolution that defunds Obamacare. It's not going to happen. And yet on Friday it did. And why did it happen? Because the House of Representatives listened to the American people, because the Speaker of the House and House conservatives stood up and did the right thing and made a courageous vote. And I would note two Democrats joined the House Republicans in doing so. No further it, it, question. It, well, look, I'd like to finish answering your, your for last question, and then I'm happy to yield for another, but let me finish answering your question. The third step is where we are now. It is the United States Senate. Now, in the United States Senate, we're going to have to do two things. The first thing we're going to have to do in order to successfully defund Obamacare is to unify Republicans, to bring together all 46 Republicans opposing cloture, opposing Harry Reid's being able to fund Obamacare on a straight 51 vote partisan vote. I believe every Republican should be unified in that. Right now we're not. Right now there are divisions in the Republican caucus. I am hopeful those divisions that Republicans will listen to our constituents. I can't convince my colleagues. The only people that can convince my colleagues on this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle are the people all of us work for are the American people. If we are able to unify Republicans, the next step, you ask me, how do we ultimately get to 60? Now, I assume the predicate of that step, that question, is that first thing we have to do is get to 51. So if we got 46 Republicans and initially got five Democrats, how would we get five Democrats? Well, as the senator from Illinois is well aware, there are quite a few Democrats who are up for election in red states states where their citizens understand Obamacare is a train wreck, it isn't working. And I believe if those Democratic senators, particularly in red states, begin hearing from their constituents in overwhelming numbers, that will change their calculus. Now, let me readily admit, as long as Republicans are divided, as long as we're shooting at each other, 
There's not a lot of incentives for Democrats to come join us. But if we can unify Republicans, then I believe we'll start with red state Democrats who will potentially lose their jobs if they continue not listening to their, their people. For a further question? Sure. I might question your premise as to whether the House was going to vote the way it did since it's voted 42 times to abolish Obamacare. That came as no surprise. But let me ask a specific question. One of the reasons that I voted for health care reform, and I'm proud that I did, was illustrated by a woman that I met in southern Illinois. The senator has spoken today about hardworking people, including members of his own family, and I don't doubt that. This woman's name's Judy, and Judy is a housekeeper at a motel that I often go to, and we've become friends. Judy has worked a whole life in manual labor. She's been everything you can imagine, a cook, a waitress, housekeeper, all of these things. She's 62 years old. Judy told me that she had never had health insurance one day in her life, ever. She'd worked every single day she could, but she never had health insurance. It turns out that Judy was diabetic, and we found some doctors and hospitals locally in her area to give her some care. We just had an announcement in Illinois uh, that's going to be officially released tomorrow about what this new health insurance marketplace in Illinois means for people like Judy. It means that we're going to offer 165 different health insurance plans in Illinois by eight different insurers. The premiums at the lowest level of health insurance for those who aren't under Medicaid will be in the range of $84 a month. But the good news for Judy is that her income is so low she now qualifies for Medicaid for the first time in her life. For the first time in her life, Judy, who would be turned down because of a pre-existing condition of diabetes, is going to have the peace of mind of health insurance. Senator, you and I are blessed to have the best health insurance in America as members of the United States Senate. So when you say you want to disband and stop Obamacare, do you want to deny the opportunity for Judy and millions more just like her for the first time in their lives to have the protection of health insurance they can afford? Well, I thank the senator from Illinois for that question, and I will say I respect his sincerity and passion in believing that government solutions from Washington can fix this problem. I don't know if the senator from Illinois shares the views that Majority Leader Reid expressed on television, that, that I don't know if your objective is, as Majority Leader Reid said his was, to move to a single, single payer government provided socialized health care. But it may be. I don't want to put words in your mouth, certainly. I don't know one way or the other what your view would be. But I will say this. You tell the story of Judy. The best way for Judy or anyone to have health insurance is to have an economy that is booming where people can get jobs and have opportunities. And indeed, let me respond with two things. Number one, before the senator from Illinois came to the floor of the Senate, I read a number of letters that have come from people all over the country. And let me just read the next one on my stack because it happens to actually be, be a counterpart to your story about Judy. This was a constituent from Brackettsville, Texas, who wrote earlier this year, quote, since the passage of what is known as Obamacare, my insurance premiums have gone up three times. That doesn't count the increases in my Medicare Part A and B that have also risen. I was informed that prior to passage that certain retirees from one group would see their company support terminated after 2013, and my support will terminate after 2018. In the meantime, I've lost two family doctors who have left the practice and must settle for nurse practitioners and physician assistants. I am fortunate to have good coverage for which I pay dearly that is accepted everywhere, but I fear the day I can no longer afford it. I am paying for Obama's train wreck ever since the bill was passed. Surely there must be a way to defund or repeal the bill. Please help. I would note for the senator from Illinois, these pleas from help for help are coming from all across the country. They're, I'm happy to yield for a question without you. I think yielding. your answer to Judy is you need a better job after working a lifetime, 62 years, hard work, the best that she can do. She's never had health insurance, and I think your answer was, Judy, get a better job. So let me ask you another question. When I voted for Obamacare, health care reform, one of the things that motivated me 
was the fact that health insurance companies would no longer be able to discriminate Ameri against Americans with pre-existing conditions. I've had a situation in my family, a child, who had a serious physical problem, who could not have qualified but for group health insurance that was available to me as a member of Congress. If I had gone on the open market to buy a policy, I'm not sure I could have bought one for my family to cover my child. So when you say you want to abolish Obamacare, do you want to abolish that part of Obamacare which says you cannot discriminate against people for pre-existing conditions when it comes to health insurance if those people are victims of asthma, diabetes, cancer treatment, mental illness? Do you want to abolish Obamacare and that protection? I thank the senator from Illinois for that question. And let, let me answer it in two different ways. Let me talk generally about what the senator talked about, about his health insurance and my health insurance as a member of the Senate. And then let me talk about pre-existing conditions separately. The first point I will make is that the senator from Illinois is passionate and, and has been quite eloquent describing what he perceives to be the benefits from Obamacare. And yet I think it speaks volumes that the senator from Illinois and I and every other member of Congress has been exempted by President Obama from the plain text of the statute. The statute provided, and it was, it was inserted quite deliberately, that if we're going to impose rules on the American people, we, be, we should be subject to the same rules. We should be put in the exchanges like millions of other Americans. You just talked about the wonderful exchange. The text of Obamacare provides that you and I should be in those exchanges. And it also provides that just like the other people in the exchange, that our employers can't subsidize it once we get in that exchange. Now, once it passed into law, the Democratic caucus met with President Obama. I obviously was not in that meeting, but I read the public reports of what occurred there. I read the press accounts, and the press accounts all indicated that the majority leader and the Democratic members of the Senate asked President Obama, please get us out from others. We don't want to be in the exchanges. Now, I see my, my friend from Illinois is shaking his head. I, look, I was not in the room. I, you can read the, the press reports all say that was what occurred. But regardless, that's what happened. So that message was heard by the president because shortly thereafter, the administration issued a ruling that exempted members of Congress and exempted our staff. And so I'm curious if the senator from Illinois is such a fan of the exchanges, is such a fan of the health care that has been provided to Judy. Uh, would the senator from Illinois then support Senator Vitter's amendment to pr provide that every member of Congress, every one of our staffs, every political appointee in the Obama administration, and frankly, I'd like to see every federal employee all put under the exchanges so that if we're going to make the rules for the American people, that we be subject to those same rules, those same plans, so that when we go on television and say the exchanges are really, really good, we're not talking about something someone else is experiencing. We're talking about our own health care. Without jeopardizing his control of the floor, I would like to respond and ask a question. I, I'm happy to yield for a question without yielding the floor. And the point I'd like to make is the senator is just plain wrong. What he's just stated is just plain wrong. Here is the state of the situation. The health insurance that you enjoy and the senator from Alabama and I enjoy, as well as the senator from Virginia, is the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program. It covers 8 million federal employees and their families, including members of Congress and our staff. For the premiums that we pay for the health insurance we choose, the federal government, as our employer, pays 72% of the premiums. This is not an unusual situation. 150 million Americans, half our population, have exactly the same arrangement. Employer-sponsored, employer, -sponsored, employer con contributions to the health care of their employees. What the president did was to say, number one, you, Senator Cruz, myself, and others, will now have to buy our health insurance through the insurance exchanges that we created in Obamacare. And with it, we will get the employer contribution as we do now, as you enjoy now personally, and I enjoy, for that purchase of health insurance. My wife and I will be choosing a policy
from the health insurance marketplace in the state of Illinois. We will have eight different insurance companies and 165 choices, and that's our insurance. What you quarrel with is an employer's contribution to health insurance. And if that is now the, your position, the position of Senator Vitter and the Republican Party, that it is a federal subsidy that should be stopped, you are affecting the health insurance, not just the members of Congress and their staff, but 150 million Americans. You better think twice about this. If you want to stop employer contribution to health insurance, that is the headline for tomorrow morning. I do not support that. My question is, do you? I thank the senator from Illinois for his certainly genuine uh, political advice and counsel. And I would note that the experience Democratic senators found of under Obamacare suddenly facing the prospect of losing their health insurance, of being forced into the exchanges, health insurance that had been employer provided, being forced into the exchanges with no employer subsidy, it is a disconcerting experience. It is an experience nobody likes. It is an experience that's lousy. There's a reason why Democratic senators were so upset. There's a reason why congressional staff were so upset. What my friend from Illinois is not focusing on is right now there are Americans all over this country who are experiencing that exact same sentiment because of Obamacare. You know, just a few weeks ago, UPS sent a letter to some 15,000 employees saying we are dropping spousal health insurance because of Obamacare. Now that's 15,000 UPS employees who had insurance for their husbands and wives and suddenly those husbands and wives are left without health insurance and being told go on an exchange with no employer subsidy. Now Senator Durbin just made a passionate case why that's a terrible thing to tell people. I agree. Listen, my preferred outcome is not to subject members of Congress, congressional staff, political appointees of the administration and federal employees to the exchanges and Obamacare. My preference is to subject nobody to that. But the reason why Senator Grassley inserted that amendment is because we've got a problem of a ruling class in Washington in both parties. This is a bipartisan affliction that believes that the rules that govern Americans working Americans don't govern us. And so if we're going to set, set up a system, if Obamacare is going to force Americans all over this country to lose their employer-provided health insurance, to be forced onto the exchange with no subsidies, then the men and women who serve in this body should feel that pain exactly the same. So when we go on television and say, this is great, we should know of which we speak because we got skin in the game and we're not being treated better. And I think under no circumstance should Congress, <laughs> members of Congress, be treated better than hardworking Americans. And that's what President Obama did, and he did so by all reports at the request of Democratic senators in this body. Senator Yale, for one last question. I know the senator from Alabama. So senator Yale, for a question. I'd like to ask senator a question. And then you can the senator from Alabama. Well, well, senator Yale. I am happy to, I'm going to yield to the senator from Alabama for a question. I'm happy to return to the senator from Illinois if he would like to, to remain, but I want to be fair because the senator from Alabama has been waiting for some time. So I'm happy to yield for a question without yielding the floor. Well, I thank, I thank the senator. And uh, an econometric firm and others have studied what's likely to happen in our economy. And as I understand it, they predict far more people will be dumped from the uh, coverage into the exchanges uh, than they have today. So people that are under health care coverage today, they are uh, being matched, uh, paid for there by their employer. The employer discovers that it'd be less expensive uh, to uh, quit providing health care coverage, let those individuals go uh, into the exchange, and they may or may not provide any subsidy to them. So I do think the extent to which we as senators go into the exchange and we are guaranteed the full uh, subsidy we've been getting is different than is going to happen to millions of Americans. Uh, I guess the senator maybe has heard that argument and how it's possible that uh, if uh, 
businesses decide to drop health care, individuals can then be uh, forced to go into the exchange without any subsidy at all. Uh, uh, and ask Senator Cruz if uh, he understands that that's uh, possibly uh, what could happen to uh, large numbers of Americans. I think the senator from Alabama is exactly right. Uh, we're seeing Americans all over this country hurt from Obamacare. And I want to suggest, Mr. President, that the problem we're debating today, it's, it's bigger than the continuing resolution. It's bigger than Obamacare. It's bigger even than the federal budget. The problem is the men and women of D.C. are not listening. They aren't listening to the millions of Americans who are asking for more accountability, more responsibility, and more truth from their elected officials. And it's time to make D.C. listen. I would observe that during the course of this afternoon, the hashtag Make DC Listen has been trending number one because the American people are frustrated. They're frustrated that Democratic senators are not listening to them. They're frustrated that Republican senators are not listening to them. The whole debate we're having right now is not about strategy. It's not about process. It's not about procedures. And it's not about all of the pundits and pollsters and consultants The problem is D.C. isn't listening. Everyone in America knows that Obamacare is destroying jobs. But the senator from Alabama so eloquently talked about from econometric predictions, you just have to get outside the beltway to any of the 50 states and actually talk to people that are trying to find jobs. Talk to small business owners that are trying to struggle under the 20,000 pages of regulations. Everyone in America knows Obamacare is destroying jobs, that it's driving up health care costs. Let me encourage right now, everyone in America, President Obama three and a half years ago promised the average American that by the end of his first term, by the end of last year, the average American family's premiums would drop $2,500. Let me encourage everyone in America whose premiums have dropped $2,500 to go online and tweet, Obamacare cut my premiums. And you know what? I'm willing to venture in every one of these states, if all of the Democratic senators who support Obamacare are willing to say, I will take only the votes of those of you whose premiums have gone down. I can tell you right now on the Republican side, I'll happily take the votes of everybody else. Because I'm going to predict that's not going to be a 50-50 election. It's not even going to be a 60-40 election. Everyone knows this thing isn't working. And Washington is pretending it doesn't know. This process is rigged, and that's why we've got to make D.C. listening. They're traveling across Texas, just like the senator traveling across Alabama. You hear the stories everywhere you go. doesn't matter. doesn't matter what town you're in. doesn't matter who you're talking about. You hear the stories. You see people with disabilities saying, please, stop Obamacare before I lose my health insurance. You see young people who'd like to be working towards a career saying, please, I'd like a job. You know, I met with a whole bunch of servicemen and women who just come back from Afghanistan at a military base in Texas. And I ask them, as I try to do in any gathering that is, is a, a small enough group that you can do this, go around, share an issue that's weighing on your heart, that you pray about, that you're concerned about. I remember one young soldier said, I'm most worried about jobs. When I come out of the military, am I going to have a job? All my buddies, when they come out, they can't find jobs. And everyone nodded and said, that's exactly right. The American people want to stop this madness, and so do I. Here in Washington, we pass million-dollar bills, billion-dollar bills. No one's ever read without even voting on them. We call it unanimous consent. And it's only unanimous because we don't let the American people know. I, you know, it would be very interesting to bring 100 of our constituents in on any unanimous consent bill that's spending a billion here, a billion there. See what our constituents think about that. The system is designed deliberately to hide what we're doing. In this debate right now, there are many members of this body that are happy that the debate is covered with obscurity over procedure, obscurity over a motion for cloture, on a motion to proceed, on a thingamawagawa. Nobody knows what that is. 
And you know what? That benefits members of this body because it lets all 100 go back to their citizens and say, hey, what were you for? Yeah, yeah, I was for that. Because I was for the motion to whatchamacallit. And no one understands what that is. You know, one of the things we see, our leaders demand approval for bills before they're amended. So we're being asked this Friday or Saturday to vote to shut off debate on this bill before we know what the bill will be. We don't know what amendments Harry Reid's going to file, but we're asked to cut off debate nonetheless. It's like former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi said, pass it to find out what's in it. <laughs> you wonder why the American people are disgusted with what happens in Washington. That's business and usual in this town. Listen, the way this is planning to unfold is very simple. Majority Leader Reid has said if he succeeds in cloture, if he succeeds in shutting off, vote on, uh, shutting off debate on Friday or Saturday, that he's going to introduce one amendment, and by all appearances only one amendment, to fund Obamacare in its entirety. And that will be subject to a straight 51 vote threshold. Now, there are a couple of dynamics going on. Number one, Republicans are actively debating among ourselves. Should Republicans vote with Harry Reid and the Senate Democrats to allow Harry Reid and the Senate Democrats to fund Obamacare with a straight 51 vote partisan majority? Now, Mr. Speaker, I don't find that a difficult question. I think that you should unify all 46 Republicans that know we should not enable Obamacare to be funded and that a vote for cloture on Friday or Saturday is a vote to fund Obamacare. They are one and the same. They are identical. If you vote to give that power to Harry Reid to fund Obamacare, then you are responsible for it being funded and for, by the way, it being funded in the same broken process where there are no amendments, there is no opportunity to change it, there is no opportunity to offer anything, you don't have an opportunity to offer an amendment, I don't have an opportunity to offer an amendment. Instead, it is brute political force. But I'll tell you an upside. An upside, frankly, from some members of the Republican caucus. If debate is cut off, they can tell their constituents, I, I, I voted for the House bill. Not true, but they can tell them that. But even better, a 51 vote threshold. Here's the dirty little secret that people don't want to admit. There are more than a few Republicans on this side that affirmatively want a 51 vote threshold on funding Obamacare. Why? Because they want two outcomes. Number one, if we have a 51 vote threshold on funding Obamacare, I promise you all 46 Republicans will vote against it. The straight party line vote, which means every Republican can go back to their district and say, Mr. and Mrs. America, when I had the opportunity to vote against Obamacare, I did it. I did what you want. And the rest of it's kind of hidden in the procedural mumbo jumbo. But the beautiful outcome and the reason why some Republicans want a 51 vote threshold is if it's 51 votes, we will lose. As the president is well aware, there are more than 51 Democrats in this body. It will be a partisan party line Democrat vote, exactly how Obamacare got passed into law. And I'm going to suggest that Republicans going along and saying we want a symbolic vote is not listening to the people. Look, the dysfunction's on both sides. The Democratic members of this chamber, I understand. Look, Obamacare is a Democratic law signed by a Democratic president, passed into law with only Democratic votes. It is hard if you are a member of a political party to admit, gosh, this thing that we put a lot of political capital in, it ain't working. That's a difficult, that's a risky thing for anyone to say. Now, I will encourage, my hope is by the end of this process, we will see some Democrats, some Senate Democrats, listen to their voters and recognize, say, listen, I, I thought this thing would work. I hoped it would work, but it hasn't. It's what the unions have said. The labor unions that publicly, vocally supported Obamacare, and many of them were, were active proponents of getting it passed, they've looked at it and said, you know what? We thought it would work. It hasn't. There's no shame in admitting that you tried something and it didn't work. I very much hope over the course of this debate we will see some Democratic senators doing so. Now, I would note that the fact that Senate Democrats are not participating, are not here, 
makes it less likely. But on the Republican side, the game is the same. You know, Washington, D.C. is a strange place in many, many regards. One of which is symbolic votes are treated as tremendously important. You know, I remember I'm told of a conversation that Senator Lee had with a member of the House when early on the House was, had, has not, not, had not yet voted to defund Obamacare, but there was discussion about casting a symbolic vote to do so. And the American people were quite unhappy with that and expressed that view. And both Senator Lee and I expressed that view that we shouldn't be engaging in procedural games. We should actually be defunding Obamacare. And one particular House member who will remain unnamed called Senator Lee and, and, and made a comment that I thought was particularly revealing. He said, you guys should be grateful. We gave you your vote. And I remember thinking, what a curious turn of phrase. Grateful. What an odd Washington view of things. Why should we feel gratitude for getting a vote that is 100% destined to lose because it's offered in such a way that Harry Reid on a party line vote can fund Obamacare and yet we can all have a symbolic vote? And the reason, frankly, Mr. President, is this is a town that for a long time neither side has listened to the people. This is a town that for a long time there are elected politicians that want symbolic votes. Let me be very clear, I don't want any symbolic votes on anything. I think every one of us, our constituents, should know what we believe. And whether we get a vote on it or not to demonstrate it shouldn't matter because if we're standing and fighting, if we're walking the walk, our beliefs should be self-evident. D.C. responds, the D.C. establishment responds, anyone that tries to tell the truth, look, I promise you, my observations right now that there are some Republicans that would like a symbolic vote and then would like to lose so that they don't have any risk of it actually being defunded, I promise you, those comments are not... Uh, getting me invited to any cocktail parties in Washington any soon, anytime soon. And that's perfectly fine. I don't particularly enjoy cocktail parties anyway. You know what, though? This town needs a lot more truth-telling. It's absolutely true. Everyone here knows it, but you're not supposed to say it out loud. There's a custom where we kind of wink at each other and say, listen, you're telling your constituents one thing, I'm telling my constituents one thing, and let's not bother to give them the opportunity to know the truth. If we got a hundred of your constituents or mine, if we got a hundred citizens from any of the 50 states and we put them in this room instead of a hundred senators, I promise you, number one, our constituents, not a one of them would care about a symbolic vote. If you got a hundred people, they'd be like, well, well, why do you want a symbolic vote? What's the point of that? It's only politicians who make their living staying in office that want symbolic votes, because symbolic votes are useful for getting reelected. They don't actually change the country. They don't make people's lives better. But they do help politicians who want to get reelected and want to run a campaign ad saying, here's what I voted to do. If you've got 100 citizens from the Commonwealth of Virginia, the great state of Texas, the great state of Alabama, what they would say on Obamacare is, we got to fix this. We got to get people back to work. We got to deal with all the young people that are stuck in dead end jobs because they can't get a job coming out of school. We got to deal with all the people, all the single moms working in diners who are finding themselves working 29 hours a week because of Obamacare. We got to deal with all of the people who are struggling because their health insurance premiums are skyrocketing under Obamacare. We got to deal with all of the people who are losing their health insurance under Obamacare. That is why I'm speaking out today. It's why so many others have come here speaking out. Because we've got to make D.C. listen. That's what this fight is about, is make D.C. listen to the American people. And I very much hope that the debate over the course of this week has a real effect. Changing the culture. That's why this body is held 
10, 12, 14 percent approval ratings. You know, Mr. President, I remember a few months ago when all of us were in the old Senate chamber, all 100 senators, it was a bipartisan meeting, it was actually a very interesting, productive conversation. And I remember a number of senators commenting about the low approval ratings that Congress has held in and saying something to the effect that it's because we're not more efficient, we don't pass more laws. And I got to say, I think that gets it exactly backwards. I have never once found any constituent in the state of Texas, and I suspect there are not many in your state or my state or anyone else's state who says the problem is you guys aren't passing enough laws. That's not what I hear from the people. Now, it's what you hear from politicians in Washington who'd like to pass as many laws as possible so they can go take credit for them, but it's not what you hear from the people. The people, in, 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 the people in, at home say, you guys have done enough damage already. I'll tell you why I think we're held in such low esteem. It's because we don't listen to the American people. Every poll that has been done for years of the American people, whether any state, your state, my state, any state, even bright blue states, democratic states, you ask the American people, what's your top priority? Jobs and the economy is the overwhelming answer. That's true if you ask Republicans, even if you ask just Democrats, ask just Democrats in just bright blue states, jobs and the economy is still their top priority. Or independents or libertarians, anyone you ask. And yet you and I have both served, Mr. President, in this body nine months. I would note in the nine months we've been here, the United States Senate has spent virtually zero time even talking about jobs and the economy. Not on the agenda. It is not, we don't talk about it. We spent six weeks talking about guns, talking away about taking away people's Second Amendment rights, and no time talking about fundamental tax reform, fundamental regulatory reform. Today, talking about defunding Obamacare, the biggest job killer in the country. You want to get jobs in the economy going? There is nothing we could do that is more important than defunding Obamacare. And what's the case? There are right now three members of the United States Senate on the floor of the Senate and two members of the United States House. If you ask the American people how many senators should be here in the debate over defunding Obamacare, the biggest job killer in this country because the American people's top priority is jobs and the economy, the American people would say all 100 senators. What possibly do you have that's more important than works? We can vote and say, you know what, Congress is exempted. We have special rules that apply to us. It's not our problem. Yes hurts hard-working Americans. But if there's one thing Washington knows how to do, it's, it's ignore the plight of hard-working Americans. Or we can show a level of courage that has been rare in this town to step up and say we will risk retribution from our own parties. We will stand up and speak the truth. We will stand up and champion our constituents. Elected officials need to listen to the people. Mr. President, together we must make D.C. listen. Will the gentleman yield for a question? I am happy to yield for a question without yielding the floor. You know, Senator Cruz, as you were mentioning, the fact that it's time for the people to stand up for their own rights and it's time for the people's elected representatives in Washington to stand up for them, reminds me of the fact that sometimes people do take this challenge and sometimes they don't. Sometimes people will square their shoulders heading into a challenge, and other times people will simply engage in shoulder shrugging and ignore problems altogether. A few years ago, I was traveling through southern Utah with my family, and we went to a, a restaurant. It was a sort of a fast food restaurant that had a salad bar. For some strange reason, instead of ordering a cheeseburger, I ordered a salad. I don't know why, but I got the salad bar. I went through the salad bar with my plate, and I was getting all these horribly healthy foods on my plate, lettuce and vegetables. And then I saw at the end of the salad bar something that I didn't expect, a little bonus. There was a little tub of chocolate pudding, and I thought, this is fantastic. I can feel like I'm eating a healthy meal because I'm eating a salad but I get chocolate pudding in my salad so I 
put a bunch of that on my salad plate. I sat down a few minutes later, and of course, rather than eating the salad, I went right for the pudding. There's only one problem. The pudding was disgusting. <coughs> it was spoiled rotten. It, it, it tasted like it had been left out overnight unrefrigerated for three nights in a row, which is um, uh, not a good thing. So I immediately thought, I've got to find somebody who works here. I've got to tell someone that the pudding is bad so that, you know, they don't have to deal with any other customers eating rotten pudding. I found the nearest employee of the restaurant, and I said to her in a sort of hushed tone of voice, hey, um, the pudding is bad. You need to do something about it. You need to replace it. It's rancid, spoiled, rotten. Please do something about it. She looked at me with a sort of blank stare. She couldn't have been older than maybe 17 years old. And she just said, I'm not on salad. And then she walked away. My response to that was, you know, I'm not suggesting that you're on salad. I all of a sudden wondered whether I had stumbled across some rift among the employees of this particular fast food establishment. Maybe she didn't like the implication that she was one of the salad bar attendants. Maybe that was a bad thing. I don't know. All I know is it was kind of strange because she worked for the same employer that ran the salad bar. I would have thought she would have cared about that. Instead, she said, I'm not on salad, shrugged her shoulders and walked away. I wonder if that's sometimes what we have too much of here in Washington. I'm not on salad. I'm not on Obamacare. I'm not on excessive regulation. I'm not on dealing with a law that's going to result in a lot of Americans losing their jobs, having their hours cut or their wages cut, or losing access to their health care benefits. Well, our problems are acute. Our problems are, in fact, chronic. And we've got to do more than shrug our shoulders. What we need right now is more shoulder squaring than shoulder shrugging. We've got to have people who will follow after the admonition of Ronald Reagan, who declared more than 30.